Hello, and welcome back to Getting to the Top, where I interview transformational leaders about their leadership journey. Today, I have the absolute honor of interviewing Hala Thomas' daughter. It, she is an absolute phenomenon, and you will hear her story. I mean, this is the first person that I've interviewed that's had an entire chapter written about them in a bestseller. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But it's really, really exciting. I've known Hala for a couple of years now. And um, every time I hear or learn something new about her and her journey, I'm positively blown away. She is currently the CEO of the B Team. And it's a the B Team is a collective of business and civil society leaders who are catalyzing a better way of doing business for people and the planet. She started her leadership in corporate America, working for Mars and Pepsi. She was the, on the founding team of Reykjavik University, where she established the executive education department, founded and led a successful women's entrepreneurship and empowerment initiative, and was an assistant professor at the business school. She was also the first female CEO of the Iceland Chamber of Commerce, and she went on to co-found an investment firm with a vision to incorporate feminine values and ESG into finance. And the company successfully survived the infamous economic meltdown in Iceland. And she was, in 2016, an independent candidate for the presidency of Iceland. And, and she entered a crowded field of candidates and finished runner-up with nearly 30% of the vote. And a lot of those things are actually interrelated um, because she was just seen as such a steady pair of hands to lead the country and to be able to fiscally manage them moving forward. And so it started, I, I don't want to jump into it, but I thought that this was such an exciting story about this started as an online petition. Yes, that's how that started. <laughs> Raquel, you were making me blush before we even get started, but um, thank you for that introduction i really am just hala and i feel <laughs> the honor is mine to be here with you because you are definitely a transformational sister in this space of leading the world towards a better place so uh, it's my honor to be here with you today oh i'm okay so we're, we're gonna both start to get misty but I, so i want to start at the beginning at the beginning beginning how did you how did you become this this powerhouse did you you were a little girl growing up in Iceland how did you what did you think you were going to be who did you think you'd become <laughs> well that's a, a very interesting question um well I think I'm lucky I grew up in a country that currently leads the world when it comes to gender equality so I think I had role models on a culture that supported me in a way that not every woman I know is lucky mm -hmm. enough to grow up with. I also think I grew up in a country that was sort of leading at the time, uh, I hope will continue to lead, but when it comes to sustainability, you know, we mm -hmm. were the first to really truly use hydropower and geothermal power to heat every house. And, you know, so I, that was my dad's business. He was converting homes from, uh, using fossil fuels to using geothermal energy when I was growing up. And I like to play office where my sisters like to play with dolls. So I guess early I was interested in business, but my mom, she was a special education teacher and she really cared about what kind of a society do we uh, live in and, 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 and we shouldn't leave anyone behind. And she always had this vision that even people who had been institutionalized because they had disability or different abilities as she liked to talk about it uh, you know how could they still have work how could they still have independent living so i sometimes like to say that i grew up as a as a child of an entrepreneur in in sustainability and business and an entrepreneur in taking care of people and in a country where capitalism with care for both people and planet was more normal than it perhaps is where I live today in the United States or where I have lived uh, around the world. So I'm very, very grateful for that upbringing, but no one really told me, I think at that time, nor did I necessarily think at that time that I had any ideas that I would end up in the role that I'm in today, Raquel. I'm, I'm very honest. I don't know that I knew any of that until it happened. <laughs> So what kind of what kind of child were you? How what were you as 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 a youngster? 
entrepreneurial. Um, my dad, who passed, bless his heart, um, ran the business, the office from the house, and because he would be out of working, he's, he was a plumber. He had lost his parents when he was young, and so we never had. We had a very sort of. I never lacked anything, but. I lived in a household where I was taught that working hard and figuring out how I was going to get through life was an important part of how I was raised. And so, um, but I think I was only five when I decided I was going to try to help my dad grow his business. And I organized the kids in the neighborhood to put his business cards in every house. The only problem was the business card said we fix toilets and sinks and my dad wasn't doing that anymore. So <laughs> my, neither my mom who answered the phone nor my dad were very grateful, but I guess I showed early sort of an initiative to organize people around me to get things done and starting things. And I really believe it was transformational for me when I was seven years old that women in Iceland, this is 1975. So now I revealed my, my old age, but, um, Women in Iceland took the day off that day, October 24th in 1975. And I was just so inspired by their collective leadership, by their courage, by the fun that they had to kind of paralyze the country for a day because nothing actually worked in Iceland when women were not at work. And I do believe that and the fact that five years later, we were the first country to democratically elect a woman as president in Iceland really impacted me during formative years. It made me yeah. think that, you know, women could be leaders, one, and two, that women could do leadership differently, collectively. They could share leadership. They would have incredible collective power when they stand in sisterhood and solidarity. And yeah, so I, I at least benefited enormously from growing up, I, again, very, very grateful. And I know not everybody has been giving that kind of um, context when they grow up. So deeply grateful both for rather humble, hardworking beginnings, but also really ambitious and bold and fearless women uh, yeah. as role models and all around me. So when that, that, that protest happened and, and the women stayed home, what, what did you understand about that at that time as a seven-year-old? Like, how did, you, how did you understand what was going on? Yeah, it's a good question. I remember, you know, as, as we don't remember everything from that age, but I do remember it, it was on my mom's birthday. And so I remember and my mom had at the time eight sisters and two brothers, a, a few ha are gone now, but my um, they had made all the cakes and stuff for the birthday the day before because they were not going to break the strike. They were going to stand mm -hmm. in solidarity. But there was cakes and a party at my home and their two brothers and their husbands were supposed to do the cleanup. And they were sort of supposed to do everything on that day. And they didn't do a great job because back then, honestly, it was still a question even in Iceland if men knew how to cook. I have a funny story that hot dogs sold out at every grocery store in Iceland because that was the meal most kids got if they got anything when men were in charge. So it was, a, it was an interesting day because the reversal of the roles was so visible to me because my mom had, my dad had always worked very hard. And while my mom always worked and her sisters did that as well, they, they did the homework too. It wasn't as seared as in Iceland it is today. Um, but I remember asking one of my mom's younger sisters, one who I was close to, why are you on a strike? What's this all about? And she answered very simply. She said, because we want to show the world and the world was the Icelandic world mostly at that time. I don't think they had ambitions to influence the world at large, but they have, and they did. But she said, we want to show the world that we matter, yeah. that women matter. And I think I had this little this seed planted in me that I also wanted to matter. I just remember yeah. feeling that. I remember her feeling strong when she said it. And I remember feeling inside of me that I also want to matter. And I, you know, don't think I knew at the time, Raquel, but I go back to that seed many, many times throughout my career that if I'm doing a role or if I've been in a role where I don't feel like I can matter or I'm doing something that is going to matter, then I'm not using my time or, or whatever talents I may have wisely. Ah. Oh. That's absolutely beautiful and, and such a such a, a wonderful uh, thing to happen at such a pivotal moment, you know, and, and that's it. Eh? Many of us who are fighting for rights, we just we just want to matter. We just want to, you know, we just want to be seen yeah. as human well, beings like everybody else. It's the fundamental human need, I believe, has been sort of one of the 
lessons learned in life is that every human being wants to be seen, wants to be valued and wants to be of value. And we are just uh, really wasteful when we don't try to unlock all of that potential that sits inside of every single one of us in service of this better world that that some of us make it our full time job to do, but every single person can contribute to. And so I, I think this aids also changed my ideas of what leadership is. I don't think it is something given to the few um, or only to those who sit in positions of power. I really feel like leadership is something that is inside of each of us and the work of life is to unlock it in service of a better world. Uh -huh. um, some of us get there early, most of us like myself needed to try a lot of different things and make a lot of pivots to, to get to a role where I am today, where I truly feel my own purpose and principles are fully aligned with the role I'm in. And I've been in that very awesome position for the last five years, but um, I found a lot of purpose and principles in every role I had on the way, but I don't think I felt the complete match the way that I I did the year I turned 50. I, so I think to those listening, one of the things I would uplift is I think we all have a journey. Uh, we should enjoy the journey. We will probably make uh, many pivots on that journey, but ultimately, hopefully that journey is about coming close to mattering in line with our own um, purpose and principles. Yeah. I love that concept of pivoting because I think so many of us uh, feel stuck sometimes and you know you think you're on this road and that's it that's that's the only option for you so speaking of pivoting where did you start what was the first job yeah well so in Iceland we had to work so and my father had been um, without parents from the age of seven and so he had worked at a farm so at the age of seven I worked at a farm every summer when I was not in school learned a lot about hard work and some hard conditions uh, but that was my first job at a farm. And then, you know, teenage years in fish factories and then late teenage years working, you know, importing cereals to Iceland and working in office jobs. And so I think we work from an earlier age in Iceland when I grow up than even my own kids have, although I, I've made a point that my, my kids are 19 and 21, that they actually do various jobs because I think it grounded me in the real life, real economy, if you will, to do that. But probably fair to say my career or my leadership job started in corporate America after my MBA or during my MBA, I was an intern with a Mars company or the M&M Mars company, and then moved a few years later, did a full-time job with them. And a few years later, went to Pepsi Cola North America. So I sometimes like to say I clearly liked sugared products, but I, <laughs> um, and it was like 20 kilos a, a ago. I also like to recognize because <laughs> that I don't recommend that part, but I really do think that I also got to a point. I learned so much from Mars and Pepsi Cola. I, I can, you know, had great mentors, learned a lot. It was hard work, um, but I didn't find enough meaning and purpose in those roles and pushing yeah. more sugar products out. I, I mean, I left corporate America to come back to Iceland after a decade because something was missing. I didn't have a word for it at the time. I didn't know it was called purpose. I don't think we were talking about that in the 1990s the way we are, thankfully, today. Yeah. But I knew something was missing in my own personal life, but also in my professional life. And I knew I longed to put my time into doing something where I felt like I was in service of something bigger than me and my salary and my career track and the whole sort of the eye of corporate America was not resonating with me, the Nordic. I needed more of a V mission <laughs> to mm -hmm. get up in the morning, to work into the evening, to work on weekends and so on and so forth. And I think I found that at Reykjavik University when I joined uh, you know, really bold and brave female president. Uh, it was not that common to have female role models and said, let's build a new university in Iceland, one that pushes for gender balanced leadership, one that pushes for entrepreneurship, one that pushes, you know, for making Iceland competitive based on what kind of how we how we develop all of our talents to be in service of Iceland's future. And 
yeah, I found a purpose there, really meaningful purpose there. And, and then probably had my kids during, you know, two years apart when I was doing, doing that and building this university, worked around the clock. And when I was not working, had kids who needed to be breastfed and woke up. So I didn't sleep a lot. But during those years, my kids probably taught me as much as being at Reykjavik University about what it means to have purpose. And and I, I just think becoming a mom is probably the most important work I've done and it continues to be the hardest work I do yeah. <laughs> even though after they are adults. So I, I also think I learned that I don't, I respect those who choose one or the other, but for me, it was always about integrating a life where I could be a mom, where I could be the human I am, the hell I am, and, and where I could have really purposeful work where I would try to learn a lot myself, but also try to help others learn and, and unlock their leadership and service of something bigger. And so I yeah, that. that's where I came yeah. about in my 30s, I would say I, I came into my my own purpose and principles. And it's, it must be it must have been such a switch from from, you know, a, a, a big Fortune 500 company going to a university. What was that like? Because you you would have learned so much at, at PepsiCo and at Mars and, you know, about about global sort of commerce and then to move then into a university and, and to start this women's entrepreneurship program. Tell me about the, the, the sort of juxtaposition of those two. It's such a good question. And I would even before um, say that I think there were some fun, fundamental insights I gleaned out of my corporate America time that I really have served me well and especially in the role i am in today where i'm working a lot with leaders in corporate america and on the global corporate uh, stage so i'm really so glad i had that but one of the insights was that mars was a privately owned company at the time ah. uh, and still is uh, owned ah. by the same family and it was at the time i believe the second largest privately owned company in the world i don't know where oh. they were now but it's definitely one of the leading privately owned companies in the world still and they were so focused on principles they had the five principle of mars and the first course i took was life at mars and i was constantly sort of trained to really lead in line with those principles principles so principled leadership was really ingrained in me at mars and i really do think the company lived it and lives it today even as a big global company but then I went from Mars to Pepsi and Pepsi was at the time the largest listed company in the world. And frankly, it had more employees than the entire country of Iceland. So for me, the little girl from Iceland, it was a really big um, job and a big organization to navigate. But I and I learned so much about leading change in big organizations because Pepsi was very progressive and catalyzing like new HR practices and uh, all kinds of things that I learned so much about and I'm grateful for, but I did always have a sense when I was at Pepsi that the market, the capital markets, were a really harsh bosh. So there was such a push for the financial returns that they needed to yeah. deliver. Um, it was that the values that I still think Pepsi really was trying to have, they didn't always feel as possible to me as in private held ownership. So. Searing all of that just to say, I think I was just in my late 20s when I realized that there's something broken in an economic system that pushes profit at the expense of everything, at the expense yeah. of the planet. And I got to know many people who burned out, especially women leaders. I got to know many practices that didn't feel right in terms of how we treat the environment. Now, both organizations have done so much since and are you know, leading in many ways, so full respect. But I realized that for me, I needed greater meaning, truly living purpose and principles. And at Reykjavik University, founding something from the ground up is so interesting because you get to yeah. actually create the DNA instead of always having to uh, try to transform. Inherit it, yeah. Yeah, so it's a very, very different thing. And I think it's where I discovered that I actually really like leading chains, but my favorite way of doing it is by being entrepreneurial and being able to do it in line with who I truly am. Because in many ways, you spend a lot of energy, um, not necessarily fighting windmills, but fighting some the crisis of conformity that sits in leadership, in the, be it the boardroom or C-suite yeah. or 
even throughout large organizations because they continue to do things the way they always have been and it's sometimes incredibly challenging to change that to be more fit for the future that we we need to craft together and so but I'm that's really what you do to... now right that that is what you do now get people to you know yeah. think differently and and to approach things <laughs> think differently is the name of the book that has the chapter and I highly recommend this book. It's such an excellent book. And not just because of the whole chapter on Hala, but it, it just to talks you through how you, how you really just sort of adjust the way that you think. But how do you do that? How do you get people to think differently about you know, purpose and, and, and commerce and business? Because that's what it requires right now. That's what this moment requires. Yeah, and the B team that I lead today, and, and, and I actually renamed my own role, not just CEO, but also Chief Change Catalyst, because I mean, that's really what I'm doing. I'm working with 32 leaders who decided 10 years ago, the organization is 10 years old uh, this year. 10 years ago, they decided business as usual is no longer an option. And, and I don't think I need to explain that for long to anyone listening, but climate change, nature collapse, inequality, low trust. Uh, we're even at war in Europe now. Um, social media has changed our, and media, uh, changed our well-being, and we have a well-being crisis in people of all ages, but particularly in young people. And we have a great resignation happening in workplaces. So we have a poly crisis situation. And I think the beating leaders knew 10 years ago that we were heading into really tough times, and th times have only gotten tougher. And I think what I did with the B team when I joined is very much what I think every individual and every organization needs to do. And it's to craft your own inner compass. And I would mm. even call it a moral compass. Um, I don't think you can be successful as a leader or an organization today unless you have an absolute clarity on that. So the first thing I did when I, you know, full of, of, of uh, imposter thoughts uh, came into the first board meeting with beating leaders who are larger than life personalities and have done outsized things in this world was to sit down and craft our beating leadership compass and get really clear what is our purpose in this world? What are our principles? What are the characteristics that we are going to embody and show up with in this world? And we made a very simple drawing, not necessarily simple to get there, but we got there and have great clarity on our moral compass in this world and we're trying to catalyze leadership in line with that compass in everything we do so our strategy comes from there what we do what we don't do how we choose new leaders how we say goodbye to leaders like we really th use the compass as our gps and i think every individual needs that and i've had the i don't know maybe the wisdom of someone else a good friend uh, or two who advised me to craft my own compass fairly early in my career i've done 16 versions of it so okay. because I keep learning, but I've yeah. had the same version probably now for about seven, eight years, because I really feel like I figured out what it was about, where I clearly state my own purpose and principles. And perhaps the single most important advice, there's lots of books about how you can do this, but the single most important one is you have to drop from your head to your heart mm -hmm. to be able to really figure out what you care about and how you're going to unlock your courage in service of that. Because there's so many um, people out there who think they know what you're all about. There are yeah. so many theories out there about how you should show up and do. I'm not, I don't prescribe, well, I read all of it and I take it all on board and I am an eternal student and learner, which I think is very important. But I really find the guidance and wisdom by dropping from my head to my heart very regularly and really try to do that with others to get them to be the leaders we now need them to be. And there are various ways you can do it. Talk to your children is very helpful. Have intergenerational dialogues and design. Uh, create a junior board for your company so that you actually have like a feeder board or bring in the children of the board directors to ask questions once a year or create an advisory board with a, you know, for your own life or your kitchen cabinet of people who come from different walks of life than you do. There are lots of different tactics you can use, but ultimately it's about getting clear about your own inner compass and using that to make the hard decisions in your role and as you pivot and, and, and go towards a role that is uniquely there for you and your uniqueness, your authentic leadership. Oh, I love that. 
And you know, it's funny. Um, I think it was Walt Disney who said, "If you if you know your values, decision making is easy." And and I think that that's so true. You know, once you set your moral compass, while that in and of itself might be a difficult journey to figure out what it is, and even as you said, it might be difficult to get there. But once you have that compass, it makes figuring out how you get from where you are to where you're going a whole lot easier because you know which roads you will not take. It really does. And I am telling you, saying no to opportunities is at least as important as saying yes to them because we so often, and I would say before I figured out that I needed to really uh, be clear about my own compass, a lot of people, especially after I ran for president, people had so many ideas about what I was supposed to do. But a very good and wise friend said to me, before I ran, she said, if you run and you don't win, promise me that you will take time before you choose what's next and mm -hmm. use that time to really dig into your compass and be very clear and use it to make decisions. And so I almost took another role than the B team when I was nine months into the year that she recommended because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just a hard worker. I don't know how to pause and take a look at myself and life. I just know how to work hard. I've been raised like that. That was such good advice because during that time, I really clarified my compass and said no to a lot of things, but I almost said yes to a role that I today know would have been the wrong one at nine months. And then B team came like perfectly as I was coming up on the 12 months and I was ready and it all worked out like it was meant to be. So I guess another advice I would give, and I know it's not available to all of us. I was lucky I was able to be a keynote speaker and do things to earn enough money to pay my mortgage and take care of my family. But if you possibly can create space um, to sort of step back in some way, even if you make a date with yourself once a week or one weekend a month or uh, go for a week of your vacation, just really to have a date with yourself, drop from your head to your heart, be somewhere beautiful, ideally in nature, doesn't have to be complex, but really make the time to design your life and not and be the president of your life, because that's what I got out of running for president. I really became president of my life and understood what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do. And so the second half of, of what I hope will be a hundred year of happy and healthy living <laughs> will be fully aligned with what I want and not just what other people think I should do or shouldn't do. And I think one needs to sort of take that charge in order to have a life that is designed um, for you. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about this presidency journey. Like what, you, you know, I remember in the book, it talks about uh, you, someone calls you and says, hey, there's a petition online. And, and you said, about what? And, you know, tell, walk me through that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. It's the scariest moment ever, because at the time we had had a male president for 20 years in Iceland. And it is a custom that on January 1, the sitting president, because we don't have a, a term limit on the presidency in Iceland, and it's the only position where every Icelander can directly elect a person, not a political party, but directly elect a person. So it's kind of an important role in Iceland. But most of the time, and I'm almost without an exception, most candidates have come from sort of having some political background and, and I didn't. Um, and was not, and while I had been inspired by our former female president very much so um, when I was growing up, I had never really thought seriously about me running for office. But I had held a lot, hundreds, if not thousands of lectures to students of all ages about leadership and how leadership is about when not something that um, is about being elite in the world. It is about you wanting to be in service of the community, society, neighborhood, family, organizations that you're involved in. And, and being in service of something means that when something is wrong, you take the mirror and ask yourself, what can I do? You don't point out the window and say, someone needs to do mm -hmm. something. That's not leadership. Yeah. So leadership yeah. is not really facing it. And so I had said that to so many students of all ages that um, 
when young people started a Facebook petition and my friend calls and says there's a Facebook petition and there's already like thousand people that are saying you should run for president and you've been talking about the world being a better place with women in leadership and we've had a male president for 20 years and there are no women being mentioned as possible candidates, only men and you need to run. So now you sort of do what you tell us to do. You face the mirror and ask yourself. And so I was terrified, Raquel, I'll just be honest. I asked myself, it was a resounding question in my head was who am I to run for president? And I had a lot of agony for quite a long time uh, about it. I went to see the woman who's currently the prime minister of Iceland, uh, asked her if she could run because I really wanted a woman to run. I just didn't want to do it myself. And because, well, I also I was not, I was well known in business, but I was an unlikely candidate for president and not nationally known. And I hadn't done any of the work one needs to do if you want to be a viable candidate. So it's safe to say that I, after three months of agony um, and after our sitting president said he wouldn't run again, uh, but then he did later, it was a very complicated run. We had over 20 candidates and, and I ended up announcing my candidacy not with that long of a notice and very unexpected one and just to make a long story short i had one percent support in the polls like 45 days before election day my campaign was very entrepreneurial largely run by younger girls and women friends of mine and young people and i didn't know what i was doing and but on the one percent day everybody asked me are you going to quit and I just, I've been raised not to quit when something is important. And I knew I didn't run to win. I knew I ran to put issues on the agenda to ask Iceland to live up to its potential as a sustainability and gender leader in the world and do even more for others and with others to, to do, to work on the two issues that I care so deeply about. And, and, and I decided on the 1% day quitting is just not an option and it's not about winning, it's about living the principles that I set for my campaign and they were to be of service, to enjoy the ride no matter what came my way, to be transparent about my background, being from business was not necessarily seen by a, as a benefit by everyone. This is 2016, it's the year of the Panama Papers and so mm -hmm. I had run an investment firm, there were lots of things I had to overcome with trust issues that also existed in Iceland, on the, even if many people who knew me trusted me enormously, there were others who didn't know me and didn't know if to trust the person from business. And um, yeah, my last one was girl power and everyone, my last value, and everyone had told me, don't shout about girl power. That's only gonna exclude some voters. So just keep quiet about that. But on the 1% day, I decided there were very few volunteers in my office that day, most, a lot of people, you know, kind of dropped their candidacy because it was getting hard. And I just decided I'm, I'm going all the way and the, you know, I can achieve what goes on the agenda. I can show how I will show up as a leader. I can choose to be the kind of candidate that I think others should be because running for office can be ugly and, uh, and it's not easy. It's the hardest thing I've ever done, but it's also the time that I really became the president of my own voice, my own values was fearless about sharing my passion for girl power. And somehow I went from 1% to the nearly 30%. And some people said I needed another week or two to win. Um, and no regrets. It was the hard, I, I will admit, it's the hardest thing I've done, Raquel, because you, I am a B leader. I believe in shared collaborative leadership. And when you're a candidate, you need to put yourself out there and it's about you. And there was a lot about that that was very hard on me. But in some ways it also made me uh, very clear, <laughs> no yeah. doubt about who I yeah. am and what I stand for, and because you can't hide, you yeah. can't. Hide. And you have to own it. You have to own it. Just have to own it. So ever since I ran, I think some of the imposter thoughts that I think are always going to be part of of my head, and I always need to learn to live with. They just, I learned to deal with it. I learned to drop from my head to my heart when it was hard. I, I learned to stand in my own voice, in my own uh, power. Uh, and I learned a lot about my country and the things that they are facing. I learned to listen to people that, honestly, I thought my country is so good and it is on so many levels, but I also saw a lot of things that are maybe not okay yeah. and that I, deeply touched me. I danced with older people in elder care homes and I sang with young kids in schools and I spoke to teachers who are still paid a portion of what wealth managers are and the people who 
kind of man is the future of our people. They're not respected. And there were so many things that became so clear to me. And um, I don't think I would be at the B team today if I had not put myself out there and learned the things I learned about myself and my own society and really became clear that I was going to spend the rest of my time to truly try to make transformative difference in this world. Um, and you did, you changed the race completely. I don't, know if I, I, don't, I don't know if I changed, but it ended up being three men on me, which is interesting in many ways. And I do think that I brought like issues went on the agenda because I was part yeah. of it. I made yeah. friends with other candidates. I, you know, one of our strongest and most known politicians who entered the race after I did and was certain he would either win or be runner up was fourth place. Like, I really think I brought a new leadership playbook or a new political playbook and to bear and um, I'm proud of how I ran and no regrets and frankly sometimes feel like I really won because yeah. I came out at the end and my family myself my friends the people who helped me were proud of yeah. uh, what we did and so there are many different definitions of winning and also yeah. winning isn't everything um, yeah. the journey and how you get to where where you get to is, is, is everything. But my favorite part of this whole journey that you were on was that, you know, your student heard what you said about, you know, not, not finding the problem, but understanding you have a role to play in the solution and being willing to stand up and be counted and called upon you to do that. And I think so many of us see injustice, we see wrongs, we see inequality, we see all sorts of things that aren't quite right. And we are content to sort of sit and, and either admire or criticize the problem and are too afraid to step up and say, I wanna be a part of the solution. And I think if, if there's, anything that I will leave this conversation with, it is that rallying cry that, that we all have an opportunity to be a part of the solution. But I'm, as much as I know, we all have imposter syndrome. I am astounded that it is possible for you to have imposter syndrome. So please tell me a little bit about like, how do you get past that? And why would you possibly have imposter syndrome? You are absolutely phenomenally kick-ass in every way possible. <laughs> well, thank How you. How is that possible? I, I appreciate you saying that, and I'm not sure anybody knows that about me, but I'll let you in on a little secret. I very purposefully started to speak about it openly after I ran, because one thing I learned during my campaign, and as a teacher, and maybe as someone who's cared and mentored and worked with women in leadership and girls who want to find their power in this world, that we all have imposter thoughts. We may not all have an imposter syndrome, but we all have this question, who am I to do something about that? Who am I to run for president? Who am I to raise my voice or even use my vote? Or who am I to change where I work or like leave an organization because I don't like their values? I think we all have these imposter thoughts. Um, and I just think it is because, and I'll, you know, this is hard for, for me even to say because I'm so proud of Iceland's position when it comes to women empowerment, etc. But most of our role models, no matter where we are from, are going to be men, they are mostly going to be white, and they're mostly going to be demonstrating what I would call the old leadership playbook, kind of know-it-all leadership. And that isn't serving us anymore. Look at all the crises we're facing in the world. So what we're trying to do at the B team and what I actually think I turn my imposter thoughts into is we're trying to show up. What does it mean to show up with courage, but also humility? And I'm actually grateful for my imposter thoughts because they keep me grounded. I won't hopefully ever suffer from hubris syndrome, which I think is far more dangerous in the world. You know, kind of men who think they know it all, don't think they need to surround themselves with people who question them or make them better don't think they need to work across the aisle because they think they just have the answers. I don't think this kind of leadership can deal with the challenges we are. So my imposter thoughts, I actually made peace with them by saying they are actually there to serve me well. I befriend my imposter and think about it as 
a pretty nasty roommate at times, but a roommate <laughs> that is sometimes right and makes sure that I actually ask questions, question that I have the answer. Um, it keeps me thinking I need to bring more people into this. Or, um, and so I look at it as a friend and the moral compass that I have really helps me deal with it so I don't suffer from it. I don't suffer from imposter syndrome or imposter thoughts anymore, but I have them. And I'm aware of them and I name them so they don't paralyze me anymore. But when they are there, I go like, Hala, get out of your head because that's where the nasty roommate lives. Drop to your heart. What do you care about? How are you going to find courage to do something about it? Both what I care about and courage sits in my heart, not in my head. So at the risk of repeating myself, it's about the moral compass because it is your guide and it also gives you resilience to stay the course when then the going gets tough, which it gets all the time for all of us who want to lead. And it is also the source of courage because courage sits down here and mm -hmm. willpower sits down here. And so I just think it's better to talk about it. I mean, when I first told Richard Branson that I had always suffered from imposter thoughts, he blogged about the fact that he's always suffered mm -hmm. from imposter thoughts. He's the world's most famous entrepreneur. I have really never spoken to anyone who's done anything in the world that hasn't had at least a period of dealing yeah. with foster thoughts. So either had it or didn't or, or wouldn't admit it. Yeah, I mean a lot of people try to hide it, but I actually think that's so wrong because it's our humanity, our vulnerability, and our ability to show that part of us that empowers others. Because mm -hmm. I think people don't sit on the sidelines because they don't want to do good. I think people sit on the sidelines because they have imposter thoughts or lack of belief that they can matter or lack of knowing a way they can matter. I think we all want to matter. And yeah. so I want to just tell people that I have dealt with this my entire life. And in some ways, I hope I'll always have that because I never want to have hubris syndrome. And you know what? I think it, it's such good guidance because if you are... Like you said, drop from your head down to your heart and you're making a decision from a place of, of, you know, of what's in your heart, of what you believe is the right thing to do, of what you think, you know, sir, is in service of the greater good. Then even if you're making not necessarily the best decision, you're making the decision for the right reasons. And I feel like that, that takes us more forward than it does taking us backward. And that's what we need, just continuous progress. Yeah, for sure. And also, I think um, leadership is often thought about as being about sort of what we're doing. But mm -hmm. I actually think leadership is a lot about who we're choosing to be. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to choose being uh, when we are stuck in doing or, or, or sort of a, a that mode. And I actually think that if we did take more space and time to be in our, our authentic selves, be it through meditation or be it through mindful walking in nature or be it in sisterhood of like-minded individuals or, or sister and brotherhood. Or, but however we check in with who we truly are and what we truly care about and what we, who we're choosing to be, the more we spend time on that, I think other things just almost come effortlessly. So I'll also say that even if I've suffered imposter thoughts, if not a syndrome for a large part of my life, I find that um, it has served me well because it does mean that I have to very often check in with myself uh, because it's very hard to stay up there in the head with the imposter. It's just a very nagging neighbor roommate <laughs> up there at times. So I check in with myself. I meditate. I, um, I try to choose to be very consciously almost daily i try to start my day with who am i gonna be um today as i need to tackle challenges as you can imagine i'm trying to lead transformative change in this world every day is not necessarily easy so um yeah choosing to be in that space is maybe one of the best leadership practices one can have i'm going to credit you with the person that turned imposter thoughts and syndrome into a superpower that's it that's, <laughs> that's that's what you've done for me because 
I, I had before this conversation always thought of it as a weakness and something to be suppressed. But, you know, I think it is so powerful to, to understand it, to be something to be embraced and to check in with and to listen to, but to manage because you understand that it's not always going to be right, but it's not always going to be wrong. And maybe it helps you prepare more or maybe it helps you, you know, check in with your heart or maybe it helps you, you know, make sure you're sure by being more inclusive. But what a what a brilliant superpower to have this this <laughs> these for, imposter thoughts. Well, thanks for saying that. And maybe the most important part, Raquel, is it definitely keeps you on your toes. It definitely helps you surround yourself with people who are better than you, and it definitely keeps you from the risk of of developing hubris. But maybe the most important thing to know, as a leader, you're far more likely to unlock things in others when you are not a knower but a learner when you are not a, um, a inhumane, uh, who can do it all kind of a personality, but someone who's as human as everyone else, um, yeah. struggling with every bit of what everyone else struggles with. And so yeah. that's very empowering to others, I have found. I didn't know that when I first started speaking about it openly, but I've been really, really pleasantly surprised with how empowering other people find that I share it. So I'm not going to hold back, even if it goes out of vogue, because I want people to know that they can still be leaders, even if they have imposter thoughts, if not a syndrome. They can still Love be it. leaders, and we need them. Indeed, we need all of us. Yeah, we need all of us. And on that note, I want to thank you so much for spending this time with me. I, I felt guilty, honestly, asking you, because I know how incredibly busy you are, and I know how powerlessly you work but I also knew that your story would inspire someone and that we would learn something new that we would take with us for years to come and I thank you for sharing this time with us and for sharing your story and for all of the good that you do that is both seen and unseen thank you thank you thank you how I really appreciate it and thank you for joining us and I hope you've enjoyed this and you've been as inspired as I've been having this conversation and learning about my new superpower that I didn't realize I had. <laughs> Thank you, Raquel, for doing the work, brave work you do and for having these conversations. I, I actually think that they are very, very important. And maybe if I can leave a parting thought, it's my favorite young poet, Amanda Gorman said, and it's the ending of her poem. But I just really think keeping that in mind is helpful. I keep saying it to B team leaders all the time because there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. I think that's important right now. Thank you for having me.